Well, hi, everyone. Today is June 7th, 2020, and this is episode 237 of At Percussion. I'm Carly Vina, and I'm here today with the regular At Percussion crew, Casey Cangelosi. Hey, everybody. Hey, Casey. Ben Charles. Hi, everybody. And Ksenia Komjanovic. Hey, everyone. And today we are very, very happy to have members of the Percussive Arts Society Diversity Alliance here with us to discuss topics and issues relating to diversity and representation in the percussion world. Um, this episode is, has been in the books for a while, I have to say, but it's particularly timely and relevant to what is happening everywhere in the world right now. Um, so before we go any further, I'd like to share with you all the official charge of the Diversity Alliance which is the Diversity Alliance coordinates efforts to develop and foster initiatives aimed at expanding membership diversity and enhancing community outreach with special emphasis on serving historically marginalized populations within PAS and throughout the world. So we have a wonderful big group from the Diversity Alliance here with us today. Welcome and thank you so much for joining us. Um, so joining us today, we have the chair, the current chair of the Diversity Alliance, Elizabeth De La, La Mater. Hello. Hi, Elizabeth. We have Heather Sloan, who is a co-founder of the DA and the inaugural chair of the Diversity Alliance. Hi. Hi, Heather. We have Julie Hill, who is another co-founder of the Diversity Alliance, who is currently the DA leadership point person, uh, PAS past president, of course, and according to Elizabeth, our guru. Elbow bump. Hi. <laughs> Hey, Julie. Uh, we have Rebecca McDaniel, who's the DA Operations Assistant. Hi. Hi, Rebecca. We have Jillian Baxter, um, who is the point person for gender concerns and also African-American issues advocate. Hello, everyone. Hi, Jillian. We have Colleen Bernstein, uh, PAS Professional Opportunities Point Person. Hi, everyone. Hey, Colleen. Uh, Sean Daniels hopefully will be joining us soon. He is the racial diversity point person. Uh, we also have Jamie Esposito, who is LGBTQA plus concerns point person. Hi. Hey, Jamie. We have Blair Helsing, who is the marketing and branding point person. Hi, all. Hey, Blair. Teddy Hall Jr. is the African American issues point person and secondary education point person. Hello, everyone. Hey, Teddy, and Ralph Hicks, who is the special needs point person. Hello! <laughs> and Laura Noah, who is the socioeconomic concerns point person. Hi, everyone. Welcome, everybody. I don't think we've ever had this big of a group on the podcast at once. I'm super excited. Um, ben, I think you have something to start us off. Yeah, well, I just wanted to share, like Carly said, we actually we had this episode planned far before uh, recent events. Um, but one thing a while back that I reported on was the history of the Zildjian company. And I was really, really pleased when I was reading about the, the Zildjian company. Uh, as you're probably well aware, Zildjian is the oldest family owned business in the world. They started in Istanbul and eventually in 1929, they moved their operations to the United States, the Boston area. And um, this was largely because of there was some discrimination, ethnic discrimination happening in Constantinople, Turkey, Istanbul, the same thing geographically, so to speak. Um, but when I was doing my research, it was interesting. The Zildjian Company came to the United States in 1929, which if you know anything about music history is also when jazz was sort of coming about. And uh, in 1936, this is from the Zildjian website, it says, Avidis is also quick to embrace the talented African-American musicians who are leading the jazz movement. Having been discriminated during his own childhood as an Armenian living in Turkey, Avidis vows there will be no place for discrimination at the Zildjian company. He works closely with artists like Chick Webb and Papa Joe Jones. Um, and it goes on talking about the, the, the early work that Zildjian did with diversity. And it makes me very proud to be in a field that since the beginning, quite frankly, has, has always respected diversity. And it's such a privilege to have these panelists with us today. So I wanted to start uh, by asking uh, Elizabeth, could you just tell us exactly what is the Diversity Alliance and what are the biggest goals and projects of the Alliance today? The Diversity Alliance is an ad hoc organization. It's a 300 plus members of the Percussive Arts Society, which is a large nonprofit organization that represents hobbyists, professionals, um, amateurs, which I guess are 
both of those. Um, industry members, anybody who is interested in percussion um, in the world. So the Diversity Alliance is a large number, uh, percentage of that society. And we are interested in education, fostering, supporting our diverse members. Uh, as the Percussive Arts Society says, diversity is our strength. And the Diversity Alliance is interested in, uh, as I said, supporting it and also outreach education and trying to encourage more people to join us. Excellent. Uh, Julie, I think you had something to share. So oh, um, I, I didn't want to derail anything, but it was just related to the introduction you made starting things off with, um, with Zildjian. And I, I was so happy to see the announcement they made um, just kind of getting out in front as I have with all the music uh, professionals and companies. I mean, just music is paving the way um, for, for, for people right now and reconnecting with the fact that we've needed music for tens of thousands of years and we're showing we still need it today. And I'm just so proud of that. But then the fact that Craigie and Debbie, two women leading this company that is the single old single owned family business in the United States, that they would put that statement out um, so early is really excellent. And, and Craigie uh, is a member of the Diversity Alliance. She shows up at the meetings at PASIC. She participates in the emails. And so today I kind of wrote back to Elizabeth had sent out a really nice message that was to 300 plus members now. And, and Craigie did a reply all to my comment and just, you know, was just really proud of all we've accomplished. And um, I reached out to her separately today. And I just wanted to say that's a really nice connection too to this group and to what we're talking about tonight. That's all. Thanks so much. It's so good to note um, all, the, all the positive efforts that are being made right now. Um, you know, I wanted to I wanted to ask because I know the Diversity Alliance is not brand new, even though right now it's a very, very hot topic that um, you know we're all trying to address issues surrounding diversity. Um, could Julie and Heather, could you tell us a little bit about, you know, when and how the Diversity Alliance was created? What was the process like? What were the original goals and um, what like what was the need that was that was seen? Well, my my PAS presidency was 2015 and 2016 um, and having started just working logistics even for a number of years so I could get my PASIC for free from when I was a high school student um, and just serving as I could uh, being someone who was I, I applied to the world committee which is where my specialties are for maybe 10 years in a row and couldn't even get the chair of that committee to tell me I wasn't able to be on the committee. Um, felt a little bit of resistance, um, to say the least, and uh, finally um, was, was in a position to say, you know what, I worked my way up the ranks, I'm the prez, and we need more diversity in, in our, we need, I mean, as a society, of course, but, you know, you only can change what you can change, and, um, and I'm keeping this very sanitized, but was actually met with a little, little more resistance than I thought I would be um, with the leaders of PAS at the time. We were going through a transition from executive directors, not total resistance, but people just wondering why we needed it, really. Do we really need this? Can't we just address it with our committees? And like, yes, but we need people really focusing on this. And then um, I said, so we're doing it, period. Like, that's the only time I've ever said we're doing it. I, I, and if, if you guys hate it, if it doesn't work, um, then when I'm not the president, you can get rid of it, but we're doing it right now. And that's the only like executive decision I ever made as the president. And that was basically, I called Heather <laughs> and, and said, Heather, we need this. Um, will you help me? And she said, yeah. And it was like me and Heather and her mom for at first <laughs> trying, to, trying to figure out what to do. And then it was sort of like, yeah, we want to do all this great stuff, but how do we do it? And Heather just took this extreme leap of faith and I'm so happy to see her tonight. I miss her so much and to see how Elizabeth has taken the reins and all these people involved. Like I am so weepy right now. I cannot even express, but this woman, Heather Sloan is my, and I'm so grateful for her and I will let her speak now and I will shut up. Uh, well, I'm very humbled by that, Julie. And I really miss you too, my friend. Um, so I would just add to what Julie said. Um, 
I have to say that really, if it were not for Julie, this, this alliance would not exist. Um, there was a great convergence that happened when Julie was president where um, it really started, and I want to make this a key point of what we're talking about here, it really started with listening and communication. Because in the hallways of PASIC at various years, um, women would get together, uh, people of color would get together, there would be these conversations about, yes, there are barriers, yes, there are obstacles. That had been going on and growing for a number of years. That was something that Julie and other people were identifying. So through listening, we uh, connected with the need. And after we connected with the need, we basically got people together to continue to listen, to try to focus on what are the barriers, where are they structurally, and what concrete steps can we take to remove those barriers. Understanding that we could work on the barriers within PAS, but that we also needed to educate ourselves more broadly about structural barriers within our society. So we knew that there was a lot of work, some of which we could undertake proactively, some of which we needed to educate ourselves about, and that really the key to the success was going to be bringing the voices together who were experiencing different obstacles and barriers, who had very creative ideas about how to move forward and gathering those people together so that we could make a plan together. So that's, that's how we started. And my mom really helped. <laughs> well, I was just going to go off of what, uh, what Julie was saying and, and talk about, uh, ask or ask about the resistance that you guys came up against. One of the questions we have on the docket here is why is the diversity alliance necessary and it sounds like that was something that took some convincing and i guess i was going to throw that over to uh jamie esposito and jamie if you can go ahead and usually it takes you about 40 minutes to get fired up but if you could just fast forward to that now i think i think we'd all like that so wh why is the diversity alliance necessary at i think like in its smallest terms if it's not like I'm speaking, of course, in like gay terms. So this is personal to me. I didn't see someone like myself in a position that could help me, could show me that I could do this. And like people aren't out and proud even. There's professors, many of them who are not many, but I know like very few professors who are gay. That's an issue. You know what I mean? There are very few African American professors. That's an issue. And this is like issues that have been a long time ago. Um, so the fact that it's still a problem, like we're in 2020 and I like can't believe it. And it's getting um, more, more motion, more, the more people listen, the more we can see that it's absolutely a problem. Even the fact that they started this, I think three years ago, was it? Three or four, three years ago? Three? Okay. And so many people, 10, five, would you say? <laughs> Damn. Damn. <laughs> um, the fact that so many people have joined, it's very, like, obviously there's a need. This, all the people who are part of this alliance wouldn't be here if they didn't think like it was something we needed. And there's still a lot of people who are pushing back on this. It's not like it ended. We had issues last year when we showed up at PASIC with ideas and we got shut down. You never know what's going to happen. So it's definitely a need. Um, and moving forward, hopefully it's something that can converge together to be enveloped so it's not two separate things and we can just all be a diverse alliance together. If, if I could follow up, Jamie, uh, we did a whole episode with Jamie and her duo partner, Stephen, and their uh, Spectrum Ensemble. And if you're interested in more LGBTQ plus issues, uh, be sure to check that one out. But Jamie, could you just, we talked about this earlier before we were recording, could you just tell about your shirt real quick? Oh yeah, this is the Music is Gay shirt because music is gay. Um, and so we created these as our first uh, shirts for Spectrum Ensemble. Um, and right now we're also doing a fundraiser for Black Lives Matter. We have queer musicians, or it's queers for black lives and musicians for black lives. And you can find all this information on Spectrum Ensemble's uh, Facebook, I believe, and Instagram. Awesome. I just wanted to chime in. I'm not sure exactly um, the resistance Jamie's referring to from, from PASIC last year. Um, but, but I do want to say that I, I feel the pendulum is very much switching 
in our favor today. And Elizabeth may want to comment on this, but uh, never have we had less resistance to the, the, the worth of the Diversity Alliance with PAS and getting communication and um, just really using us as a vehicle to help PAS, which is what the intention was always with Joshua, our executive director, with the executive committee and the board of directors and advisors. Um, so I know Elizabeth might want to chime in on that, but just also to mention, you know, initially, I think, you know, as Jamie said, we think about ourselves when we feel marginalized, you know, so I think about myself as a woman not able to get on a committee, you know, 20 years ago. And that's how we that's start to, to be connected and feel passionate, I think, which is normal. Um, but we, we've made, and I've got a slide I can show you. I, I don't know if it's appropriate right now to show that we've made a, a lot, not enough, but a lot of progress in terms of gender equality. It's still not enough, but it's way better than it was. But in terms of other marginalized populations, um, we are just scratching the surface. And I think that that really is not the fault, though, of our guiding organization. I mean, while they can help and assist, it's our school systems. And we have to get um, different populations involved in K through 12 music education. Um, that's where the fault is in my opinion, because if there's no students, no one can apply. So it's not the fault of the governing body to suddenly um, facilitate that if, if our education systems don't facilitate it from a young age. So it's a bigger, uh, more endemic problem. Yes, I would love to add to what Julie said. Um, the Diversity Alliance is, we would like to be able to support everyone in the Percussive Arts Society. And as Julie said, and Jamie and so many other people um, we, many of us at times have felt that the Percussive Arts Society perhaps wasn't there for us or, or wasn't uh, perhaps representing us at times. And we would like to flip that. And I think, think this past week we have been able to serve um, in that capacity as a supporter. And um, Joshua, it's really Joshua Simons has made all the difference. Um, this past week, with all of the brutality protests, um, this crisis, people have really been reaching out to PAS for comments. And of course, like many other uh, organizations, they want to know what PAS is doing, um, what we are doing ourselves to make changes and also to support our members. And jo Joshua answers every single email and phone call he gets and he has been working with us and asking us for help. Um, specifically, Teddy and Jillian have been working very hard this week as well. Um, and uh, we have had no resistance with our executive board. Um, we're looking ahead to many really productive meetings and exciting things the rest of the summer so that hopefully at PASIC we'll have some um, very important and meaningful discussions and um, it's a it's not a great time for the country but I think that hopefully we'll have a lot of change within PAS soon already. <laughs> well it's so great to hear from both of you that the amount of resistance today is so much less than you know what five years ago because we, we think like that's nothing in the history of even the organization and, and everything like five years is a short amount of time to go from where, like, I'm not sure if we really need this to, this is exactly who we need to be supporting. Um, so a couple of things that have been mentioned so far, lead me to the next question. Um, Heather mentioned kind of systemic barriers that exist. Um, and one conversation that is being had a whole lot right now is how to eliminate systemic racism especially in, in education, I think, is a conversation that we need to have. So I wonder if um, maybe Teddy and Ralph might have something to say. What, is, what does this mean for us as educators in the percussion field? What can we be doing? Well, the first thing is um, there's often a saying in the Black community that they'll be what they see. You have to have representation. Representation matters uh, not only in the elementary and the secondary level, but also at the university level, uh, as has been stated, and it's, it's no uh, secret, uh, when you look outside of uh, non-HBCU universities, you do not see that many African-American 
uh, professors at predominantly white institutions, uh, and particularly, I can name two, and that's my teacher, Ricky Burkhead at the University of Mississippi, and my other mentor teacher, uh, Tim Adams at the University of Georgia, and I believe uh, Jimmy Finney, who still may be teaching at Indiana State University. Uh, if you go around and even look into uh, a lot of the percussion studios, uh, I would dare say you may even have maybe less than 1% African-American undergrad or graduate percussion majors. And uh, you have to feel welcomed and you have to feel comfortable. And those relationships uh, start with universities working with uh, school systems in low income areas and predominantly black neighborhoods, as well as with colleges reaching out to HBCUs and forming those relationships with students who may desire to go to, go to uh, graduate school. And again, PAS has been making uh, a valuable effort uh, through the Diversity Alliance uh, to, to see that things change. And um, we're looking forward to some more changes to come in the near future. Very well said, Tay. Thanks for your input, man. And I appreciate me being on this this uh, this Zoom. I feel like a, the dummy in the room, but <laughs> that's why I like putting myself in that position. But uh, I, I taught in public school for 19 years, and then I switched to real estate recently. But I realized uh, it's almost an empathy deficit where we spend our entire upbringing being told we can't talk about this. Oh, it's impolite to talk about that. Oh, we can't talk about that. And so we have an entire generation, maybe even two generations now that just don't know how to talk about it. Right. And we are setting such an awful example because I just want to exist in means. You know, I, I just want to throw a meme that shuts that person down, makes a joke. And I'm like, yeah, I showed them racism is over. Like, mm -hmm. no, <laughs> all you've done is tick that person off and you've put them in the defensive where now they feel mm -hmm. like you're attacking them personally and that now it's no longer a discussion, it's an argument. Now it's let's see who can come up with the coolest meme. Let's see who can come up with that one liner that will just wrap up the entire issue the country has and just, oh, it's over. And I remember so many times, like I would hear an adult say, oh yeah, I know, I, I, I have a really bad temper. I get that from my father, or I got that from my grandparents. And it's like, well, yes, that's kind of what happened. So where do you think our kids are getting their behavior from? Where do you think they get the behavior that just, no, I'm not listening to you to, repl um, to, to understand. I'm just waiting for you to stop so I can reply. And uh, that, that has grown because that's what they see. That's what the children, because I'm sorry, uh, back up a second. I taught one year of high school and just absolutely hated it. It ate my lunch. So I switched over and spent the rest of my 18 years dealing with little kids, doing nothing but beginner band. So I got to see these kids in their rawest form. And anytime any kind of political thing will come up, you could, I guess like, man, I hear your dad. Like, I, I hear you saying what your mom says to people. Like, you, you, you're not quite understanding how to have this conversation. We've robbed them of that tool. So what's the only thing they know how to do? I'm just going to repeat what I hear my parents say. And so that the conversations never go well when they try to bring them up in, in intermediate because once they've said what their parents had said, they don't know how else to continue the conversation. So I feel like... Um, we need to focus on learning how to have that conversation because we just don't anymore. You know, the um, argument fallacies are everywhere. There's straw men, there's just non sequiturs, and that's just a normal part. But what the kids can't see is like, well, we don't get anywhere when you focus on that. And so I remember in my experiences, the, the hardest part for doing that in the primary stage, the intermediate stage, is the line between education and indoctrination is just razor thin. And there are a lot of parents that are afraid of that. They're afraid of what their teacher might be telling their kid. And if, if I were to venture outside of drums, oh man, they'd come after me. Like, why are you talking about that with my kids? And so what I figured out, I tried to do is, um, uh, I even wrote it down. It's like, even though, so that basically is telling me that I can't talk about racism in my class. I just can't. I'm not allowed to. And I accepted that because of how bad that could go so quickly. 
And so rather than teaching to the issue, I found ways to teach around the issue. And so find a way to make the, like the point that Billy's got a $25 mallet while Sammy's got an $85 mallet. Like what differences do we see? Does that mean that Billy's going to be less of a drummer just because he didn't have the nicer mallet or finding all kinds of ways to address the issue without addressing the issue because we know how we are. We want these things solved like that. We, 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 we seem to think that just one protest is like, okay, are y'all done yet? Is racism over? Can we continue yet? Like that's, that's not, we, we shouldn't just be waiting for it to stop. We need to continue the conversation while they're young so we can maybe help them understand what's going on. Cause I mean, if you all have kids, have y'all talked to your kids about what's going on? They don't understand. They, they don't see it. And it's causing an unbelievable amount of stress in their lives. So I think for kids, learning how to have the conversation would probably be the most important step. I think a cool thing, I just, a, a quick thought, um, if you're not allowed to engage in the conversation, like Ralph said, well, sometimes you, all you have to do is say, hey, Anthony Davis, composer, just won the 2020 Pulitzer. Um, you can just mention demonstrate that piece instead of uh instead of another beethoven or another mozart just say hey here's a piece boom this go look up who the composer is if you want and if you happen to see that they're black well great i didn't i didn't say anything about it i just shared it it's a that's very perfect easy, easy way perfect. to do what you're saying that's all right because when with the kids are when they all just repeat what their parents said if you even mention any type of political thing it just becomes trump that's all it becomes. That's all they hear the parents talking about, whether right or left. They, they lose sight of the issue and they just join the argument rather than the discussion. Um, yeah, I just wanted to. So Ralph and Teddy both brought up some very important points and a couple of them I just want to tease out and reiterate a little bit. One of them is um, that so when we're talking about systemic barriers, one of things we're talking about is that there are certain things that have been centered and thought of as defaults that now need to be decentered. So we need to decenter whiteness. We need to decenter maleness so that there's space for a larger conversation and greater diversity. So when we're talking about the idea that there was some uh, resistance to the idea of a diversity committee or a diversity mm -hmm. alliance. A lot of what I would hear from leadership in the beginning was, you know, what do they want? What do they want? So there was a real feeling of the people who are, are wanting to form this alliance are not us. They are some other and we don't know what they want. So there's just a couple things I want to say about that. Um, when people who are in some position of privilege, whether it's through the color of their skin or their socioeconomic status, their uh, level of ability, um, when people in the position of privilege take on the responsibility for educating themselves about what their privilege does for them, and when we do that work and when we do the reading and we do the listening, things change very quickly, much more quickly than if we keep the burden on people who are being marginalized to explain to us why they are marginalized. So one of the things that there is less resistance now, what I would like to see as next steps is more proactive education that decenters what we have thought of as the defaults all along, because that is where a lot of times the barrier is. Mm -hmm. um, and I think that that's, that's just one of the important points. So we're getting there. We're not quite there yet. Well, I had a, a question I wanted to ask to Ralph in particular as someone that's worked in public school education. Um, I think, and I, uh, please no one chastise me for saying this, but I think in a sense, diversity about something like race or gender or anything of that nature is in some way an easy discussion to have because of course we should have black percussionists of course you know women should have an equal place in this field as men um obviously it's there's 
barriers to overcome with that, but I think that's a pretty straightforward discussion. Maybe easy isn't the right word, but straightforward. Um, one thing that I'm curious about, Ralph, with your experience in public schools is working with differently abled uh, students. And so, for example, I, I teach at a university in Texas, and there is, in a sense, I think, such an unfortunate push toward competition in Texas, almost at the expense of music education at times. Absolutely. And when you're in this heavily competitive arena, if you have a student with a uh, physical or intellectual disability, um, you know, it's, it's like, well, where, where can I stick this kid where he won't be noticed? Um, and it's, I mean, I'm glad that those students are able to be included, but I don't, I feel like they're being included at the expense of not contributing. So what is your take on differently abled students being able to participate in music in public school and beyond? Yeah, I'm glad to answer that. What, what part of Texas are you in? I'm down in the woodlands just north of Houston. Oh, gotcha. Yeah, I've, I've, I've judged a solo and ensemble down there. I'm about an hour west of Fort Worth in Stephenville, Texas. Okay, cool, man. I won't be driving there very soon, but yeah. So, uh, well, <laughs> I mean, I, I think the two of us can understand. I mean, Texas is an enigma. I mean, what, why are the band programs so big in Texas? Football. That's where our funding comes from. That's why, like, I, I went to, I went to University of Kentucky for my education, but with every intent of coming straight back because I was in Kentucky and I student taught with someone who one person ran the whole band program, and I kept getting these weird looks. When I was like, "What? Your middle school didn't have three directors? Your your high school didn't have five directors and a full time percussion person and a full time guard person on full salary with benefits?" That's not average. And so, um, yeah, so I can understand, but with that pressure, what do the taxpayers expect with that money? They expect results. They, they want to see it in the business world. ROI is that they want to see a direct relation between them spending their money and seeing the result of that. And unfortunately, like you said, we made an awful, awful decision to decide that competition was the way that we would meet her. Like that was going to be our metric was how many trophies can we bring home? How many band programs or how many um, clarinets can we get into the all states? And it's really interesting when you have, when you talk to band directors say, hey, how'd your year go? That question, that answer right there tells you that person's brain. Cause they might say, oh, we had so much fun playing this music and I got to know these kids like this, like this. But then some band directors, some band directors will say, oh, it was a great year. We had these many people make region band. We won this competition. We placed this place. And it's like, that's, not what I asked you, you know, that, that's, that's, that's kind of, that, that's very telling that where when someone asks you how it went, you immediately go to what accolades you got. But like you just said, what about those kids that want the music experience, want the drumming experience, but have three fingers? You know, or I, I even got to teach a kid that had a little beginnings of a thumb on this hand and like a crab claw on this hand. That's all he had. And had I not been the percussion teacher at that school, they would have said, no, no, he can't be in the percussion program. He won't succeed. The kid could speak fine. He had no intellectual disabilities. He just came out with some deformities. And so we worked with the Shriners Hospital and they came up with these little straps where the kid would just like, it would strap onto his arms so he would play like this. And oh my gosh, if you ever tried to help him put his sticks on, you <laughs> felt his wrath. It was like, no, I can get this. And it was amazing because he had like this little, he could do these little things and all of a sudden he's ready to go. It was amazing. That kid made the second band at the school the next year. So had no, no one even given him that chance of, of not just of inclusivity, of just understanding like, hey, everyone can play a role in this program that goes against, well, how will this kid help me win? How, how will this kid help us get our numbers higher in region band? It's like, well, he won't. That's not why he's in it. Don't make him be in band just to prove how good of a band director you are or how, just to prove what amazing band program you have so maybe the principal will pay for buses to go to this. Like, no, that's not what it's about, you know? And um, so, it, it's still a, a definite uphill battle. It definitely depends on the actual teacher. I've never seen a school district be able to codify that and put it into policies of you will accept kids of these disabilities. It's always been that teacher 
uh, it's their experiment. And I hate using that word, but that's the word I would use that would get me out of that conversation. When I would start getting asked, well, it, will this kid get to go to Solon Ensemble? Will he win a medal? You know, every time they would ask me that, I would just make sure I was saying, this is just my experiment. Like, we're just trying to see if this will work. And every time the experiment worked, but every time I had to pretend like it was the first experiment I was trying, because it just, it was extremely difficult. I'm sorry if I'm rambling. Did that kind of answer your question a little bit? Yes, yes, that's okay. wonderful. And, and one thing you said that I think is so key is you said you had the Shriners Hospital help. And I, I had a student with CP uh, in, in my program and uh, as a non-major in the marching band. And yeah, like people don't realize like it, it doesn't come out of your budget. Like it, yeah, if you come right. up with a solution, there's a billion different ways you can get someone else to pay for it. it it's like a, it's a, money is a non-starter. You can easily get some contraption made or whatever if you need to. Right. Well, I wish I could have, um, if I thought ahead, I, I hate that. I don't do well on scripts, so I knew I wouldn't write down what I'm saying because I won't follow it. I'm just winging it, you know? <laughs> but uh, I remember I had this video that just made me cry because we do a percussion concert every year and we did like um, Take On Me, did a quick little 80s arrangement of it. And uh, we had this one kid who we put a practice pad on the snare just so he wouldn't disrupt everything. And his mama posted about it. And I couldn't believe it because then I saw it zoom in Whereas like, he's just whatever. I've whatever. seen that. <laughs> yeah, whereas yeah. Like the smile is huge, but it's like for about eight counts, he was exactly with everybody else. And that was the moment that was like, that made it all worth it. It's like, yeah, that kid sat in the back of the room, just responded how everybody else was acting. But to that, that moment right there for eight counts, he was a superstar. And it, it changed his life, it changed his mom's life, and it obviously changed my life. Mm -hmm. Ralph, I think I'm up next to comment here. Um, <clears throat> I want to thank you for your big heart. Go Cats. Uh, so James Stevens is um, going to be on a, a show that I host with UT Martin and our State Music Association soon, and he's sort of the, the, the overlord of band programs in Texas, from what I understand, the fact that you even have such a person is a statement about Texas band programs. We don't have such organizations in Tennessee. Um, so it's, it's great that the state coalesce, uh, is able to coalesce on a certain level. And he told me uh, when I interviewed him initially, he said, it's because we've always partnered with athletics to garner support, which is exactly what you just said. And that's great. So how would we move, I mean, it, it, do you even think it's possible to get Texas music educators to think about just the altruism of music and what it provides and not the competition piece? I mean, how do we, that's a different argument, like how do we, that's a different animal. What do you, is that possible, do you think? Well, in, Con in Connor ISD, no, because, um, they have SBDM, which is site-based decision making. And so basically the principal makes every decision for that school. And so there is no, we're gonna make this come from the top down. Like uh, you can do that as much as you want, but if that principal doesn't wanna do it, then you're out of luck. So what you're saying is we'd have to get to the superintendents above their level. Right, right, and I think, uh, uh, as Andy Salmon, another UK alum who is just tearing up the percussion world at the Woodlands High School. I'm lucky that my daughter is one of his students in his front ensemble. Proof is in the pudding, you know, and that's kind of where um, I'm heading with Let Them Drum. My little nonprofit down here is I'm trying to force it into the, into the public eye, kids with disabilities functioning with a Scottish pipe drum band. Or, you know, this kid who's in a wheelchair who can't speak and needs to have a bib because he can't control his drooling, look at that smile that he just got a shaker and he's contributing. So the more they see it, so I, I guess it's kind of backwards where it can't, in my opinion, it can't really be, hey, I have this idea. What do you think of making this work? I think it would work a little better of saying, hey, I've been doing this with these kids. Here's video. Here's some statements from the parents of how much it impacts them. That, that could definitely go a long way. So maybe PAS could come up with some type of packet for that. We can reach out because we were talking about doing uh, performer spotlights on the PAS diversity website, the Facebook page. 
maybe we can take that one step farther and have a packet that we can give to school districts that show this is possible. It doesn't cost you money. It doesn't take away from your competitive nature. And it's look at how much it affects. Um, and uh, what is the name of the drum corps that's for differently able kids? Yeah, I, uh, the free, uh, free players, right? Free players, yeah, I put that in the chat. Yeah, there was this, uh, it's this group for, yeah, differently abled kids. And a couple years ago, I know they, they played at DCI finals and yeah. the crowd was wonderful and, you know, cheered like they were the Blue Devils on the field or something, it was great. Right, and I, I think what we should try to do is make them not, not the exception. Like, I mean, we have to go, oh, there's this one over in this little city. And it's like, well, why doesn't every school district have that? You know, uh, why, why can't every state have something along those lines to include them? That's why, again, get credit to Joshua. I've talked to him several times, and he's been completely open to anything I've, ha I've said. <laughs> every time I've talked to him, he's been open. So I think the initiative is there. The, 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 the wants to do that is there. So now I think it's finally at the stage that we can start doing it. Uh, wonderful. I wanted to hear a little bit from Jillian. We haven't heard uh, from you just yet. So could you please chime in and uh, tell us a little bit perhaps about your experience uh, with the Diversity Alliance and what are some things that you would advise to those of us who are educators? What could we do to make things better? Hey everybody, how's everybody doing? Hello. I'm glad to be able to, to be part of the conversation. I, you know, I think um, I started off, um, I actually taught seventh grade and I taught high school and then taught college. Uh, so I have a, a lot of different experiences. Um, and I think one of the things that we need to do is kind of what we're doing, starting to do now is just have more in-depth and meaningful conversations Know, conversations where we're not afraid um, to say what we feel or what's on our minds. Um, I know that there are a lot of people who are um, scared to step out and say things. Um, and I just, I just hope that we can, you know, develop an environment where we can talk to each other, um, so to speak, as far as education is concerned. Um, just as a, you know, example, I've taught at predominantly black schools, predominantly white schools. And I know just um, when I taught at a predominantly white school, you know, it was a great environment. Everybody was really, really nice, but almost to the point where everybody was being extra nice to me um, because they didn't want to offend me. They wanted to make sure that I was okay and make sure we, we don't offend her. And when I looked around, there was nobody there who looked like me. Um, so I did stand out and I felt it was a different type of um, feeling, you know, when, you know, somebody's going out of the way um, to make sure you're okay because of what you look like or what you stand for um, to them. So um, I just hope that we can, you know, get to the root of the issues, but not be afraid to talk about it and put action behind the words that we say. Wonderfully said. Um, I was going to move on. We have a question here for Rebecca. Um, the page on the PAS website says that the Diversity Alliance is currently accepting new members. What would one need to do to become a member? Could you tell us? Sure. So what anyone should do to join is just email us at PASDiversityCommittee at gmail.com. And that might bring up a question for some people because they're like, I thought you were saying Diversity Alliance and your email address says Diversity Committee. So there's a little bit of a, a verbiage question there. Um, we use the word alliance to differentiate ourselves from kind of the, the rules for a lot of typical PAS committees because you're only allowed to serve on one PAS committee at one time. But anyone, regardless of your other committee memberships, can join the alliance at any point. So, and we actually... Um, are really happy to have representation on almost every PAS committee. And that's important to us so that we know we can be a resource for those committees and such. So anyway, back to the original question, which is just email us at PASDiversityCommittee at gmail.com. And we also have social media and we're on Facebook and we're gonna be on Instagram soon. Woohoo! So you can get in touch with us there too. Wonderful, that's demonstrating full inclusivity. It's not an exclusive society of yeah. diversity. It's inclusive, exactly. please join us whenever, wherever. Yeah, we're okay. always accepting new members. 
Good, good. Thank you so much. That's perfect. Yeah, everybody should find the Diversity Alliance on Facebook. I think we linked them in some of the posts about this episode. Um, going back to what one thing that Teddy brought up um, a while back about representation is um, I wanted to chime in and say representation is so, so important. Um, and for me, it's particularly cool that uh, Julie Hill is here on this call because around the time that I was finishing school, finishing my DMA and figuring out what's my role in the professional world, it was really, really powerful, especially in hindsight to see there's a female president of PAS right now. And knowing, you know, I didn't know everything that was happening behind the scenes, I'm sure I still don't, but knowing that there was a push to start the Diversity Alliance and to get women and minorities and under underrepresented groups more involved um, is just hugely important. So thank you, Julie, for everything that you've done. And I wanted to ask a, a question of Laura and Colleen. Um, I'm wondering how does the DA promote professional opportunities to underrepresented or historically marginalized populations? Um, what kinds of opportunities are we promoting and, and helping people achieve? Yeah, so um, I am, I should just preface, I guess, by saying I'm one of the newest um, point people on, on the committee here. So I'm kind of like just at the beginning of um, hopefully a lot of projects um, and to, to kind of answer your question, lots of different new things I'm hoping to get running um, very soon so that we can support people with professional opportunities. Um, and I, I sort of see that in a number of different ways. I think one of the most important things um, in terms of addressing systemic barriers really can come down to finances a lot of the time. And so, you know, for this is just an idea, but as, as an example, um, PAS does scholarships for people to attend PASIC or, you know, to use towards study and things like that. And I think it would be amazing to establish a new scholarship that's specifically for people who have traditionally been and still are underrepresented in this field. Um, you know, so something like that or finding a way that we can support people to be members in PAS so that they have access to the resources that PAS provides um, and cover that membership fee. Those are um, some of the ideas. And then I think um, one, and I'll let Laura speak a little bit about that as well. But one other thought that I have is um, going along the lines of talking about representation, just using our platform as part of PAS to amplify uh, projects that members of the percussion community are doing on their own. I think something we've heard a lot on this conversation is, you know, it's important for all of us to take initiative and to do something in whatever our small area of of the community is, whether it's in a school classroom or it's, you know, something that you can contribute. It's important for everyone to take initiative. There are a lot of projects out there already happening. So I kind of see uh, my role as, you know, helping to amplify and share those projects so that we can create even greater and broader, you know, of, of this alliance and really support each other. But I'll let Laura kind of talk a little bit more about the uh, opportunities. Thank you, Colleen. Um, I, just like Colleen, I am new to this. So I'm pretty, I'm very fresh. I am the socioeconomic point person. And um, so I'm actually still eager and looking for ideas from everyone. Um, but where my brain starts to go when I think about our current situation um, is how do we make things like PAS and PASIC more affordable? You know, how do, what, what are some things that we can do? What kind of conversations do, do we need to have uh, in order to try to, to make it more accessible to more people? Um, so I, it's just kind of interesting uh, with all of COVID-19 issues. Um, I, I, I'm just starting to see a lot of musicians and I don't know how you guys are with this, but a lot of musicians are really hurting at this time sorry to bring up the COVID again. Um, and uh, I wonder what kind of impact that's going to have on PAS. You know, are we going to be able to continue to grow in numbers in that sense? Are we going to be able to have a PASIC? Are we going to, I, I'm not privy to any of those big kind of conversations. So I'm just kind of throwing all, throwing all this out there. But I think this is a wonderful opportunity for for people to sort of start to sort of step back and go, okay, how can we make things more affordable? Should we try to go um, seek, um, you know, scholarship opportunities, or should we go seek try to seek um, 
basically uh, big, bigger corporate sponsorships? Or do we need to do more grassroots and try to, to you know, just get more people and make everything more affordable? So it's just uh, a lot of these sort of ideas are in the freshest and I would love just everybody's sort of input to try to, to come together. Um, so yeah, and then uh, just collecting data, trying to figure out, you know, how much does PASIC cost? I, I'm sure Julie knows <laughs> how much it costs. So, um, uh, but uh, the other thing with PASIC is uh, convention centers. You know, convention centers are actually really hurting. And this would actually be an interesting time to actually reach out to other convention centers and compete for a, probably a better price in a way I, that could possibly make it more affordable for folks. So it's just, those are some of the thoughts I've had. I can speak on this. Um, so uh, Laura and Colleen are both being very modest, but they have been working together on this issue. And so have other point folks that I have spoken to. And um, we're actually going to have a summit at the end of the summer about socioeconomic concerns. We know that PASIC, uh, PAS, sorry, right now is planning uh, for all events. So we're planning for a PASIC and in the case that that perhaps doesn't happen. Um, PAS is very lucky with its uh, location in Indianapolis and PAS um, did a lot of planning. Uh, it was very strategic when they moved to Indianapolis and still to this day, Indianapolis is uh, one of the cheaper places to have a convention. Um, but no matter what, in the end, a convention uh, appearance or convention attendance is an expensive thing. So the, um, we have a subcommittee that Laura gets to be the head of, but it is uh, something that we've all been talking about. So the entire diversity alliance is going to be, well, we have been marinating, uh, ruminating on this, and we'll be discussing this formally at the end of the summer. I just wanted to mention being on that um, smaller group for the past few years of uh, which I'm not a part of now, thankfully. Um, but the decisions that are made in terms of finances and, um, and, and more, I mean, membership based organizations are suffering um, in the United States and I would imagine around the world. I don't, I mean, PAS is international, but it's mostly US based, which is something else I really tried to work on when I was president, because I, if we're going to be an international society, that's be international. Um, and we do have members from around the world, but not, not to the point, talk about diversity, um, that we would all hope. But we are inexpensive compared to a lot of the other conferences. And um, we, had a, we had a lot of people decades ago that thankfully made a savings account for us so that PAS is not going bankrupt right now. It's not going to last forever, but I mean, these, these groups are suffering. We need to figure out ways. I mean, we can put it on them to put scholarships out for our students, but also we have to turn it around and say, how are we going to get other students to be a and, and professionals and hobbyists to be attracted and realize the value of our society and, and know that it, it has merit. Sorry, I've been on both sides of these conversations for so long, it's hard for me to find the middle ground here. Um, we, we need to help PAS continue for the long term as well. Right, piggybacking on that, I, I, I have very little experience with Joshua. Like I know him through um, when he comes to speak to us on the education committee or we talk on the board of advisors, but I've luckily also had a beer with him at the at the at um, one of those random bars downtown Indianapolis and I the discussions I've had with him I've always been so impressed how the dude just knows how to find the money it's it's insane how many different initiatives he has how many are just ideas so he has definitely earned my full trust knowing that if the money's out there he either knows he, he can get it himself or he knows how to get it so I think that conversation coming from the top down because Joshua is always proactive about us being proactive about helping that way. I just want to throw that in there. Sorry. No, and you guys might not know this about Joshua, but he's he also feels pretty marginalized in terms of he's he's Jewish. 
-hmm. And uh, he feels very underrepresented as well in a way. So he doesn't tell people that, but um, I know he wears that very close to his chest. But he's really tall. He is tall. <laughs> like, like I wouldn't mess with him. <laughs> I wanted to start by reading just a very brief excerpt of Gary Burton's book called Learning to Listen, The Jazz Journey of Gary Burton. It's an autobiography. Um, and if anyone is unaware, Gary Burton is a very famous, very prominent uh, gay jazz vibraphone player mm -hmm. that I am very proud to share the same birthday with, January 23rd. So happy birthday to both of us when that rolls around. But anyway. <laughs> <laughs> Get to the point. No, I'm just kidding. <laughs> yeah, not really. But anyway, I, I wanted to read a little excerpt. Um, and he's talking about Terry Gross at NPR and the, an interview they had, I think it was maybe in the 90s. He says, Terry and I spent the second half hour talking about the acceptance of homosexuality or lack thereof by other jazz musicians, by the music business and by jazz audiences. One of the things I told Terry was that I considered myself a jazz musician first who happened to be gay. These days, I often think about it the other way around. After all, I can go for hours and sometimes days at a time without thinking that much about music. But every moment of the day, I'm aware of being gay. And so when we talk about uh, representation, uh, maybe especially in the terms of programming, there's I, I have this concern myself also of uh, tokenization, or another term is othering. Uh, and we had a question for Sean of does intentionally programming underrepresented composers or promoting underrepresented artists amount to othering? In what way or ways is this necessary or not okay? Uh, well, it's necessary because those folks, I mean, you can call it othering, but if you don't program it, those folks aren't represented. So you can think of it as othering from your perspective, but from our perspective, we're not representative. So you, you, you don't exist. Therefore, you can't make a living. You can't put your music out there. And you mentioned uh, uh, Gary Burton, who's just, I'm just, you know, one of my uh, favorite uh, musicians. I have a study with Ed Sandin, who studied with him. Um, and I think of a couple of gay musicians that I have just great respect for in jazz, and that's Tony Williams, the great drummer. Tony Williams, which a lot, you know, most of you should be familiar with, along with Billy Strayhorn, who was with the Ellington Band. So uh, the jazz community, it, you know, it catches it for certain things, and it does have a misogynistic attitude sometimes, but, but it has been open to just about everyone and everything, you know, Jewish musicians, white musicians, and so forth. And, and it's a great thing about that music, I, I mean, I do, I do play a lot of jazz, I'm known for that, but I'm trained classically. Uh, so I've seen both sides of it. Uh, it's just great that you could just walk in and just say, well, let's play a blues and F, and it doesn't matter who you are and what color you are, how old you are, how well you even play. Let's just let's just have this conversation, and we'll you know we'll all bring to it what we bring to it. And it's so open that improvisation, and you see musicians adjusting to the other musicians, uh, regardless of uh, what their level is. So it, it, so that's, you know, that's on, on one take. And when I hear that othering, I could see if, if there were uh, black compos or composers being, being played every concert all around the country and all that. And you could say to me, oh, wait, we're just, you know, we're, but even during Black History Month, you don't see those, uh, those programs. You know, I attended uh, Alabama State, which is in, uh, historically black college for my undergrad, but I attended Ohio State and the University of North Carol Carolina Greensboro for my master's and, and doctor. And we played, there were, we didn't play any compositions by black composers for the most part uh, at Ohio State. Um, with exception of some of the one I wrote and then uh, at, at the University of North Carolina, one of our other graduates, something that, that he had written so it was just, it was really rare. And when I started doing research on symphonic works by black composers, I was, I, for percussion, I was so surprised that it, it, it wasn't a lot of folks and it wasn't a lot of pieces. And so I've been trying to get something to happen to have those works play at PAS. Just to, you know, I'm hoping to inspire the folks who, who look like me to maybe write more, do a little bit more and be involved. But those who don't look like me say, you know what? Maybe I'll program that for my kids or my students uh, at the high school level. I've taught middle school, high school, community college, and of course, uh, you know, a four-year institution and graduate level percussionist. 
Uh, so it, it's, it's definitely a need. Uh, people are talking about Florence Price right now. A friend of mine was like, oh, her music is great, you know, you know, and, and so forth. But I had never heard of it. And I had to tell, and he was thinking because I was African-American that I heard her. I said, well, I'm going to be honest with you. This was a few years back. I said, I didn't know a lot about Florence Price, just like you did. And I said, because we went to the same programs. We played at the same thing. Nobody talked about her. Uh, so it, it, it's, there's definitely a need. And PAS is, I mean, when is the last time you've seen a percussion ensemble, not a drum line, because I brought the Tennessee State drum line in 2012, 2013, whatever it was, uh, an exhibition, and I was just really pleased and thankful that uh, we were accepted, and, and it was a lot of fun. Uh, I was serving on two committees at that time, World Percussion and Marching, and the reason that was is because I, I was nominated to the Board of Advisors, it was about 10 years ago, and I said, I don't have any peers on the Board of Advisors. I said, because there's no HBCU folks here. It was only about two or three of us that actually came to the conference then. Uh, and well, PAS said, well, okay, we got something for you. Why don't you do, do some work on this committee? So I had to, <laughs> had to go ahead and, and take that chance and because uh, they gave me an opportunity. If you're not represented, let's, let's, we're going to represent you. So let's do some work. And myself and Pedro Ore, we worked, you know, six years in a row. Uh, uh, I was on two committees and at the same, but, but I knew it was important and I was thankful for the opportunity. I kind of digress. Um, but yeah, but if, 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 when's the last time you've seen a concert or symphonic percussion ensemble that was made up of African-American students from any HBCU in the country or just anywhere uh, perform at PASIC over the last 20, 25 years? I've only seen one group that was on the, uh, on the percussive notes, front of the percussive notes, and they were on the front with John Beck. And that group didn't come to PASIC. John Beck went down to Alabama State University, which is my alma mater. I wasn't there yet, but our teacher, Van Tony Free, uh, who could have taught anywhere, he's, you know, but he, he, he stayed there. He chose, he said, because he knew that we wouldn't get any of that training if he left. And he had been trained very well, uh, played Spoleto Festival Italy, uh, was invited to the junior uh, uh, New York field at that time. And, and he said, I stayed here because I knew that you guys were coming out. And he brought John Beck down and Beck heard one of our students there and said, this kid could come to Eastman. Uh, he actually ended up going to the University of Memphis. But uh, that's, and so that's kind of been my inspiration. I uh, went with Van Free when he said he did that for us. So I've always made an effort to try to give back to those programs wherever I could. But we're, we're not represented even, even now. I'm, in the state of Tennessee, we have a great day of percussion and so forth, and but, but it's just gotten wider and wider and wider over the years. And then the last year, with well, the pandemic, we didn't have it. We had, had a really great diversity uh, on that poster. I thought this is going to be great. But ironically, we had a clinician coming in to do jazz. And here I am in the state. Jazz musician was never even called or asked about what do you think of this clinician or would you mind coming in and doing something so we could have, you know, some more diversity within our day of percussion. Now, I'm not looking to to do the state day of percussion. I don't need that. I do I do fine on my own. But the, just the idea that it wasn't even thought about. That's the that's what we're talking about. Just it's about being fair and just thinking about thinking outside of just you. And, and we talked about middle school and what you know. It's really just somebody telling you the right thing. When I was a middle school student. And I would, uh, we, my mom, we, we moved. It was a management job that she was going to be better for her and us. And but we couldn't afford the best uh, equipment and so forth. And I'm coming into a school where everybody's got two hundred, three hundred dollar drums and so forth. And I'm starting out in the seventh grade band. And my folks got the drum that they said this is what we can afford. Which, it, with the stand, the case, and everything was probably eighty five dollars at best. <laughs> and that was a stretch. And when I got to the, I didn't want to take it. I was so embarrassed. I didn't want to even take it into the band room, but I knew I had to. I knew that wasn't going to be a, a question. And so I said, well, once I get out of their sight, I just put it over in the corner somewhere. And Mr. Roseberry, white gentleman, came up to me. He said, what's going on? You, you didn't have your drum. And I said, well, you know, Mr. Roseberry, I don't really have, I don't have a drum that's you know, playable. He took it out. He tuned it up. I mean, it just brings tears to my eyes. He, and all he said was, there's nothing wrong this drum. And I expect you to be in here playing tomorrow. Because of him, I'm, I'm, I'm where I am today. 
that's because he took the time. He could have said, this is just some, I, I don't have but two or three black kids in my class. I don't have to take the time. But he treated me like a student in his class. He didn't care about anything else. He said, this is what, this is what you're going to do. And from then on, I didn't, I didn't worry about the equipment or what, if it, if it made a sound, I was going to make it work. And, uh, you know, that's, that's the difference I'm talking about. That's all we need to do. Just take that, that one extra step and treat somebody decent. It'll go a long way. Yeah, I just, I just wanted to add, I, I know I, I phrased that as a question, but basically I was, I was looking to get the response that you said about, about representation. And for me, it's like, I remember I, I worked a, a little bit, not as a, a teacher, but just helping out at an elementary school. And I remember the teacher was, was playing Tchaikovsky for her class. And she said, oh, hold on, I have to get the, the, the record queued up. And I've got to get past the part where they say that Tchaikovsky was homosexual. For the you know, it's like, it's like that, that was a bad word. And uh, even recently, I found like, uh, with all the, the Black Lives Matter stuff going on, I'm, I made a Facebook post about it, like many people. And it, it, it feels so odd for so many people to say, Oh, well, the, the black musicians, it's like, they're black musicians. That's a, it's not a derogatory <laughs> term. It's not like it's not something we need to hide. And I named very clearly. I you know Scott Joplin, William Grant, Still, Louis Armstrong, Miles Davis, Fats uh -huh. Domino, James Brown, Aretha Franklin, Lionel Richie, LL Cool J. Like the list goes on. And these are black musicians. It's not. It's not like oh well these black musicians. <laughs> it's it's they're right. black musicians. And like and after that, I, I very publicly thanked uh, one of one of my biggest influences was uh, one of the band directors at University of North Texas when I went there, Nick Williams, who's now the director of one studies at the Melbourne Conservatory in Australia, fantastic wow. black musician. And I, like, I don't think it's shameful at all to talk about a black musician or a gay musician. It's so important for young people to see those uh, uh, people represented people. in their field. Yes. Yeah. Sorry, it's Hedy. I think you had something to share next. Or, sorry, Blair. Oh, Blair. Blair, yes. Hey, hi. Uh, sorry, there's a water pump running in the background. I hope you're not hearing that. Um, First of all, I just wanted to say I really appreciate hearing from all of you and learning from all of you. It's a great opportunity. Thank you. Um, and Sean, thank you for taking up the baton when you were invited into this group. Um, so I come at this from the perspective of a former chapter president and former committee chair. And over the decades, so many people have done so much hard work to build up this social network that we have of chapters and committees. And uh, Heather was chapter officer with me uh, back in the 90s or the early 2000s. We put on days of percussion. Heather and I would run the box office. We'd meet people from the community coming in and have these conversations with them, which I look back on as being some of the most important conversations I've had as part of PAS, because we were able to learn what people's interests and concerns were and what attracted them to come to the day of percussion. And this kind of feedback is so important to bring back into the larger society for us to learn from each other and to be able to have conversations with other chapters, other committees, to build a consensus around messaging and recruitment and making the society meaningful for people who might see an ad in a magazine or a social media post. And there's just that little germ of the idea that maybe I should check this out. And if they're going to check it out as someone who's completely outside the society, giving them something meaningful to hold on to as they explore what we do and why is so important. So we really have to bring our eyes and ears and our messaging out into the community. We have to have these conversations when we're once again able to, which I'm so looking forward to, being able to mingle with other people out on the street and talk to them about their lives and their musical interests and build a program that's more strongly compelling for people to hear from us why PAS can be a value in their lives. So long story short, I think the face-to-face -face interaction and the use of social media, particularly social media in this time when we're not able to be out in public together is really critically important. We have to get our ears open more and meet more people and bring them into the society and take in their feelings as we build our programs going forward.
I've been a member since uh, P, a member of PAS since 1997, and um, worked on the logistics uh, team as a graduate student, uh, graduate assistant at Ole Miss. But uh, I will say that there have been a lot of positive changes from that time uh, up until now. And uh, just to go back, circle back to what Colleen, I, I hope I'm saying your name correctly, uh, had asked about um, scholarships and grants. I have uh, been in conversations with Joshua. He is the thing that I do like about him. He's very accessible about trying to create uh, some type of uh, virtual forum or town hall meeting between uh, PES and uh, several of the percussion companies, as well as uh, several African-American drum set artists and percussion educators. Uh, and this, um, we're still looking to see if this is gonna be actually um, feasible to happen very soon. But uh, I think if we can get that done, that will be one way of uh, PAS showing the community that we're trying to all work together and not just um, just saying one thing and, and not putting any action behind it. And with that, um, we have also uh, just listed some, some things uh, to see that PAS would be able to commit to, which they have, and there are things listed on the website. So uh, Things are being done. It just may not always be on a larger scale or just um, just so popular at the time. But things are being done behind the scenes, and hopefully, within the days to come, we will see the the uh, manifestation of that, and that positive change will continue to come to fruition. But it just starts with building relationships, having these conversations, as everyone has said, and taking the time to listen and seeking to understand and not just talking to be heard. I always go back to um, uh, Seven Habits of Highly Successful People, or one of those that says, seek first to understand. Mm -hmm. And um, that's something I always try to incorporate. And I think right now, that's really what's needed in our society is where people seek first to understand instead of to respond. Yeah. Well, you know, in some ways, so many of the things that are happening, so many of the conversations that are happening and even the protests and all of the attention that we're all able to give to this issue right now, um, I, I would say is a, a side effect of the unfortunate circumstance we're all in right now where we have a little bit more space in our lives because of the pandemic and yeah. our routines have been have been uprooted and adjusted. Right. Um, and in some ways, I mean, it's, of course, all jokes aside, like 2020 is tough. Uh, it's not mm -hmm. positive circumstances, but there is some positive growth for sure that is already coming out of this. And I think we'll continue to with these changes. Um, Elizabeth, I wonder if you want to talk about some of the, the current education related projects that are happening with the Diversity Alliance. I would love to. Um, the, well, first to address something that, that many of us have been talking about today and um, before today, and that's issues like the otherism and, and uh, tokenism. And um, then just what Ben was saying was the fear to, to name things. Um, some of that, uh, certainly much of that goes simply to racism and bigotry. Some of that uh, goes back to my parents' beloved hippie friends, and uh, the belief that really everyone is the same and, and we should look to the humanity in each other and see, uh, see everyone for who they are individually. And um, they really believed in seeing individuals. And for baby boomers of a certain age and a certain ilk, that was the right thing to do. And uh, I think that there are teachers still who are of an older generation who were taught not to name, not to identify, not to identify people according to what color they were or, or um, various uh, orientations. And um, then I think that that's, that's some of what happens. And so representation is important. We're going to have a social media campaign begin in a couple weeks where we're going to have specific series. Our subcommittee point people and uh, 
some of the fabulous folks here, Teddy and Jillian and Ralph, are going to put together some series that will specifically highlight people or organizations um, that we want to showcase. And that will include some African-American um, educators, some uh, careers. Colleen has been looking at different organizations and some newer scholarships. Um, so look for that on our brand new Instagram page that Rebecca is putting together. Um, the educators, we have uh, two separate um, subcommittees, primary and secondary, and we didn't get to speak with them today, but uh, Rachel Taylor and Melanie Wojtovich, uh, they are putting together a, more resources. We'll hopefully be posting that soon. Um, right now, they're specifically working on an anti-racist anti educator resource list. And this will be a Google Doc that they're adding to all the time. It will have uh, websites, um, YouTube videos, books, all kinds of resources. Um, and, I, you know, we, they just started it a couple of days ago, and of course, it's already pages long. Um, so we're trying to really focus on a lot of visibility and accessible resources right now. And then as we go through the summer, we have larger projects. Um, but hopefully Teddy's town hall will happen in the next couple of weeks. So uh, as you heard, we have a lot of things going and um, the point people are, are being very gracious and working very hard. So. Yeah, there's a lot of work to do, but I think that we're, I think that we're on our way. And if we all are um, positive, we can really contribute. Heather and Julie created this thing that, as you heard, we've already come so far. Well, I certainly think we're all headed in the in positive directions, in the right direction. Um, even if we're still looking for what what some of these answers are, we're all still looking. Um, Heather, did you have something you wanted to add? I just wanted to very quickly reiterate um, some of the things that Teddy and Elizabeth were just talking about in terms of seeking first to understand. I think it's very important um, to do our own homework, all of us as best we can to understand our own place in the world and try to understand others. I really like the way that I think it's very important. Uh, the other thing that's a component of that that we don't often talk about is we all need to get more comfortable with being uncomfortable. Mm -hmm. There yes. are difficult conversations that we have to have because there is sy systemic oppression. It exists. We all exist within it. And being able to come at something uh, from a non-defensive posture, being able to come at something where you, and no matter where you are in the system, you allow for your own and others' vulnerability. Um, coming from a place of making someone else feel safe by maybe holding your response for a little while. This is kind of a, some, some of the stuff that Teddy was talking about. There is going to be discomfort as we move to a better place. It's, it's inevitable, it's growing pains. And that's scary because we don't wanna make mistakes. We don't wanna offend other people. We don't want to be ignorant. Um, and we want to be liked, you know? We, we wanna think of ourselves as good people. Um, we all have our biases and we all need to treat each other with compassion. And I think that to the extent that we can trust each other and respond to one another rather than react, and really, as Teddy said, seek to understand, that is going to move us a long way forward. And it's gonna hurt sometimes and it's gonna feel uncomfortable and there will be weird silences. And we just need to trust each other to get through that. I didn't comment on the chat, but I just wanted to say Heather for president, and then we're all we're all good. <laughs> oh, thank you so much for that, Heather. Um, you know, I think we have one more question we want to make sure to get to today is to talk about PASIC 2020, and I understand that um, there are things up in the air right now. Um, you know, we don't know what what is going to be happening with travel and large group gatherings and all of that. 
But um, I know that the Diversity Alliance is active at PASIC each year. And I'm wondering, Jamie, if you can tell us a little bit about what's planned for PASIC 2020. So far, and don't, don't know if we got picked yet, but we did submit a proposal um, for a panel discussion. And the session title would be called Percussion is for Everyone, Examining Our Community Through the Lens of Marginalized Groups. And um, it's like a lot of people here today who would be on the panel. It's Jillian Baxter, Ralph Hicks, Josh Jones, and Rachel Taylor. Um, and it's more like this conversation right here we can have on a bigger scale. Awesome. Thanks. Well, I certainly hope that we all get to see that. I want to say thank you to each and every one of you. Thank you for bringing your thoughts and wisdom and experiences here. Um, I wish we had hours and hours to keep talking. For those of you that I haven't met in person before, I hope that we meet soon. Um, and I hope that this, this conversation keeps happening. It's so, so important. And I appreciate all of your time and effort. So thank you so much for joining us today. Thank you so much. Thank you. Thank you. Thanks, you guys, for Thank hosting. Thank you. Thank you. This has been Thank excellent. You. Yeah. Thanks, We'll everybody. keep the conversation going. <laughs> yeah. All right. <laughs> All right. Bye. Take All care, right. everyone. Bye. Everyone. Thanks. And All cut. Right.